Namaste, hello, and greetings. My name is Dr. Sushma Taylor. I'm the Executive Director of Centerpoint Incorporated in California, United States. I'm also the President of the World Federation of Therapeutic Communities. My co-facilitator for the training is Mr. Sandeep Verma, the Chief Executive of the pro program Staying Out in New York. We are delighted to be here in India to provide training for Indian participants at the special request of Dr. Rajesh Kumar, the Executive Director of SPYM. We're really grateful to Dr. Kumar for thinking of us for this training. The uh, World Federation of Therapeutic Communities is a multi-nation uh, member organization. Our members um, represent treatment and prevention and education programs in over 70 countries. Our members hail from the United States, Canada, Mexico, Latin America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and of course, Australia. Therefore, the continents are well represented. The training modules that um, we have been privileged to provide have been developed over the course of many decades by many pioneers, researchers, practitioners who have helped to create the evolution of the therapeutic community model that, it, that exists today. We uh, in the World Federation of Therapeutic Communities are very passionate about the work that we do and we believe that ther the therapeutic community model works really well in many diverse cultures, in diverse geographic regions and also embraces different socioeconomic groups and also socio-cultural groups and we believe that is really critical to doing the kind of work that we do. And we believe that addiction treatment is work of the heart. So I want to once again thank Dr. Kumar for thinking of us and also to let everyone know that we are so excited that the World Federation of Therapeutic Communities can partner with an eminent organization such as SPYM. Our training modules have been segregated into two or different, two or three different categories. The first category is the history of therapeutic communities, how they evolved, from whence they evolved, and the pioneers that helped shape the therapeutic community um, methodology. We also have a training module on morning meeting and how to create, to hold, convene, and to facilitate a morning meeting, which is an essential element of therapeutic communities. Another one of our training modules is that of special populations, and in particular, uh, adolescents and young children. We also have a module on the essential elements of therapeutic communities, what are the core programs and interventions that actually create the therapeutic aspect of therapeutic communities. And finally, our last module was the evolution of therapeutic communities from their humble beginnings to their current robust, well-researched, well-documented, and well-practiced modality that it is today. Addiction problems manifest themselves in a lot of other domains. We know that. And, and also that's both behavioral, emotional, but affects family, social, cultural, and biopsychological. We know all of that, correct? Whatever we are going to train and teach you, you must adapt it to your own specific site, your population, your area of the world, and within the socio-cultural background of the people that you are serving. So we're going to give you broad principles, but then the application you need to make sure is consistent with the population that you're dealing with. That is really, really important. Okay, we also know that um, addiction is a 
chronic illness. It has relapse potential. There are many people who will never relapse after even a single episode of treatment. And there are others who will have multiple relapses. One is neither worse or bad. It just depends on the physiological and psychological makeup of the individual and the amount of resilience and support systems the person has. So we cannot predict how many treatment episodes will work for just anybody. So it has to be individualized and it has to be specific to that particular person. We also believe that uh, after any treatment, any episode of treatment, there must be ongoing support systems. Now, many of you who uh, consider yourselves survivors participate in AA and NA groups. Uh, others will participate in other self-help programs, but it, it is important to have a network of support systems that allow you to maintain your sobriety, your recovery. That's what, what we, we believe. How did therapeutic communities begin? Wh what was the origin? What was the nature of it? Before I do that, I'm going to tell you that the approach uh, in terms of therapeutic community programs and methods, in Europe they call them democratic therapeutic communities, and in the United States they're considered concept-based. Okay? The, the democratic um, treatment programs in Europe they believe that the therapeutic decisions should be shared amongst the staff and the residents. With concept-based, particularly in the United States, we decided that, co that concept-based therapeutic communities were developed to deal with a particular problem, a disorder, on an issue. That's where the word concept-based comes through. In 1946, a gentleman by the name of Tom Maine set, uh, created a set of principles and methods uh, that he used to help people with problems of difficulties. He was working in a psychiatric hospital. So Dr. Mac Maxwell Jones was working in this psychiatric hospital. And he had been influenced by the work of Mayo and Pratt uh, who worked in the early 1900s uh, with small, in, in small group settings, predominantly with patients that were suffering from tuberculosis. And they decided in order to deal with TB, they, they wanted to work with, with the uh, patients in small group settings. Um, Dr. Maxwell Jones, uh, they placed a very high value on communication. <laughs> and he believed that um, productive work was an essential component of any treatment. The, the definition work. In other words, people have to be engaged in activities. Dr. Ma Dr. Jones also believed that um, a great deal of therapeutic value could be placed with one person helping another. He believed that the <coughs> staff in the hospital should not be so differentiated from the patients. They wanted the staff and the patients to mingle together, have take, you know, partake in meals together, to interact in more of a social setting rather than a chair, a desk, a doctor, a pen, a patient. You get, you get the drift? Okay. So it was more of a sharing of ideas, communication, impressions, but also that the patients were actively engaged in the treatment decisions. That was a very, that was a, you know, a real shift in psychiatry. And the staff meetings were also uh, times where people could say, okay, this is what I heard this patient say, this is what I saw him do. So those impressions were communicated in staff clinical reviews. The, uh, the work that um, <coughs> Dr. Jones and colleagues did early on created a, what we call a living learning environment where the dialogue was face to face 
and that individuals were actively encouraged to become aware of the feelings of others. And um, there were positions created uh, for, for the patients. In other words, they were given a specific task, but also positions created for them so that they could feel like they were leaders in a particular task. And patients often participated in the review of admissions of new patients coming in. That, that was a real radical departure from psychiatry in those, those days. The early therapeutic communities were not developed for drug problems. They were not. They were actually sanctuaries for people who had no other place to go. There were people who were marginalized, who were not part of mainstream society, and therefore they came together in a safe environment. The um, therapeutic community concepts, beliefs, and practices have been influenced by philosophy, psychiatry, religion, and of course the behavioral sciences. The TC antecedents include the Oxford Group, and I will talk to you about the Oxford Group in a minute. The temperance movement, which most of you are familiar with, right? Everybody remember the temperance movement? Well, it was a movement in, the, in, in Europe and the United States to try to get uh, men to stop drinking. It was a, actually predominantly led by women who were tired of seeing their husbands uh, drink themselves to death and, and you know, waste all of the family resources. And so they created this movement to say, stop drinking. And in fact, uh, there is an, uh, I didn't bring that slide, but there's a slide <clears throat> where the women say, no lips shall touch our lips that have touched alcohol. Okay? You, you get the drift, right? That was the temperance movement. Women had to put their foot down and say, that's it. In the 1900s, um, the, the Christians that were uh, coming together in the United States and, and, and later when new immigrants were coming into the United States, there was a real difficult problem of integrating uh, immigrants coming into the States. You know, we had, Im they had immigrants from different parts of Europe and how did you integrate into a, in a new country uh, coming from the old country? The, the Oxford group was influenced by the Mennonites and the Quakers and the Amish. These are groups of, of, of Christians, actually. They believed in, the, in a strong work ethic and they believed that they should help one another. It was a lot of, of sense of community. Their values um, dealt with um, self-examination and living an honest life. Um, and also to acknowledge their own mm, traits of character that they needed to improve. And they also believed in making amends. Does this sound familiar to AANA tenants? Yes. You're getting that? Yes. Okay. So I'm just I'm sharing the historical context to tell you that a lot of things converged together. So these were the principles of the Oxford group. They dealt with the five C's. Confidence, confession, conviction, conversion, and continuance. So what do we say when we say confidence? Well, we're talking about truth. Confession. Talking about things that are difficult. Continuance, helping others. You see that final step? Continuance, helping others. If I'm going too fast, tell me, but I have a lot of material to cover. We, are we good? Okay, good. So now, today's TCs are really drug-free modalities that use social, psychological, and behavioral approaches. That's in a nutshell. I've already told you about the origins. We started in uh, 1946, Maxwell Jones. So when, when Maxwell Jones was talking about the democratic sharing of power, and remember I talked about democratic TCs, they followed Maxwell Jones's thinking. Hierarchies were reduced, and there was shared decision making amongst patients and staff. So in 1958 in California, Santa Monica, California, a gentleman called Charles Dietrich, who 
was um, a dropout from AA. Actually um, rented a house and invited other addicts to join him and to, to live with them and they, they created a safe haven where they could all work together on their common problems. They, they confronted one another, they uh, uh, engaged in, in self-help and mutual self-help and there was no professional staff. They were basically folks who were there uh, and people who came in earlier uh, were given positions of more responsibility. Not necessarily more authority, but more responsibility. A European system has continued uh, to be developed along the Maxwell Jones thinking. The American TCs were developed along the Synanon model, originally, originally. Today, of course, uh, most of the therapeutic communities have evolved well beyond the original Synanon model of the 19. 5860s. And so one of the things I think that we want to convey to you very strongly, and I know that that's part of the materials and the modules that we're going to go through, is that a therapeutic community model of treatment for addiction is not a punishment model, okay? It is not a model which is based in shaming people, <laughs> shaming people and shaming addicts, all right? In fact, all of the research and science, and I'm sure you're also familiar, shows that shame-based treatment or punishment based models are completely ineffective and they don't work for treatment of addicts and people get worse and people get worse all right so a very very important takeaway from this conversation is just that right now historically dr taylor is introducing different models that we had in terms of the max jones is a very psychiatrically oriented approach, right? Which I always like to highlight in the conversation because uh, <clears throat> at least in the United States, some people take the position that, well, if you have a psychiatric problem, any mental health issue, maybe you shouldn't be in a therapeutic community, <coughs> right? The opposite is actually more accurate in that a therapeutic community and its focus on concrete thinking and concrete idea, ideas and outcomes based on an individual person's behavior is quite suitable for someone who has mild mental health problems uh, in terms of, of mental health issues, but you also don't need a homogenous group in terms of the we'll type there. of we'll get there. drugs that people are using. And this came up in our ISAM discussion where somebody raised, well, is this an approach that you can have with people who have alcohol use as well as cocaine use yeah, as, as well, well as, as heroin yeah, use? Yeah. Uh, and young individuals and and the answer to all that is yes okay that in the therapeutic community style of treatment and particularly these early models that are being discussed there was not a differentiation uh, between the type of use that you had whether that be alcohol cocaine heroin and others rather this should be looked at as a universal model of, a, of affecting behavioral change rather than something that's specific to a substance or specific to a diagnosis that someone is providing, right? So if you have alcohol and depression, this is for you, but if you have cocaine and anxiety, it's something else. That is not the case. So um, going back to these original models, one of the things that they, they looked at is um, psychological and lifestyle change. Those are some key operative words. And they believed in maintaining abstinence, in other words, no use. And they believe that the power of the environment or the therapeutic milieu should be one that would support healing to take place. Now remember that, that those guiding principles because we're going to talk a lot about that. So we as staff and practitioners, we control, contain, and ensure that the environment is one of safety, both physical safety and psychological safety. And in this safe environment, healing can take place through um, help, self-help, mutual self-help. It is like a family environment. That is what a therapeutic community does. We create family um, in a, or, or we 
create community. By 1978, everybody was thinking that um, most therapeutic communities were like alternative lifestyle uh, settings where people could uh, come together, uh, live together, and, and have, you know, share in, in common household chores and support one another because the uh, medical model wasn't working. Uh, in Maxwell Jones, he wanted hierarchy to be reduced because he didn't want to see psychiatrists and nurses to be separate from the patients. That's why he brought them together uh, to, to share common uh, meals together and talking together so that there wasn't a up-down, uh, you know, interaction. With regards to the um, Sinanon model and Chuck Deutsch, they believe that an addict is an addict is an addict. Okay, whether you come from a rich background or a poor background, therefore you don't come in and say, I'm a better addict than you are because I come from a better family. That's the non-hierarchical model. That's the beginning of the story. It's not the end of the book. Okay, therapeutic communities have evolved over the last 40, 50 years. And we have a lot of science now attached to our programs and our methods. A lot of research has gone into it, and uh, in the next module, SEEP is going to go into the science behind the evidence, but I wanted to at least explain to you what we mean by that. This is, now I'm giving you the broad brush, and you're going to get details as we go into different modules. We're going to go and drill them down. But let's talk about what we consider the, the, the disorder, okay? We know that physical addiction occurs within a psychological framework, correct? and also lifestyle. Right. We also know that um, with those who are addicted, uh, mainstream values or pro-social values are either undeveloped or underdeveloped. Now let me give you the, the definition of both. Uh, undeveloped may be for the young folks, adolescents, young children who are getting into drugs. They are undeveloped because developmentally they have not progressed in their lifespan. Adults, however, it's underdeveloped where they have chosen to not pay attention to the values of society. So you get the difference between undeveloped and underdeveloped. Okay? It's a, it's, I'm, I'm giving you this key distinction because um, the age of onset is really critical and our interventions for um, children and pre-adolescents and adolescents is very different than interventions for adults. Obviously because of the lifespan issues that we deal with at different stages of our lives. Okay, we also know that uh, the addicted person has problems in not only dealing with cognitive uh, processes and decision making, but also in social interaction. And of course because um, they have chosen to um, bond more with the drug or the alcohol, um, they have not formed attachments to others that would be relevant in their lives, whether there's family or teachers or, uh, you know, other, or, or friends except for other drug using friends. Not everybody who has a difficult time expressing uses drugs, okay? But drugs will allow that person to separate themselves from their emotions and to actually mask their emotions. People generally use drugs for one or two reasons. For pleasure, right? To enhance pleasure or to avoid pain, correct? Okay, so both pleasure and pain are associated with emotions. So if you are using the substance, you are somewhat cut off from your spontaneous emotional states. And the main thing we're looking at is lifestyle restructuring. But in the case of young people, it's lifestyle structuring. I'm going to continue to, to, to deal with that because some of the people here in this room are dealing with 
very young people. So we, we want to, differ, I want to always distinguish. I'm going to do a, a piece on adolescence uh, for you either today or tomorrow when we get around to that, okay? But lifestyle restructuring or structuring is very, very important and we need to make sure that our people get a value-based roadmap. Uh, a way of making the right decisions for themselves based on a value system that is not shaped by a peer using network. Because we know that people who use drugs, they bond with other people who use drugs and alcohol. And we also know that most of the time in order to support their habit, they're getting involved in petty crimes and other behaviors that we in society do not believe is, are, are, are good behaviors. So they will bond with like folks. So what do they do in terms of their own internal value system? They don't develop the va value system. So we want to make sure that the folks that we are treating, we allow them to develop this internal roadmap, a value system. We can't impose it, but we can create an environment in which they develop it for themselves. We, um, we want to foster a pro-social change, and as I said before, we want our folks to internalize new attitudes, uh, new values, and of course then behave in a way that supports the new uh, framework for their lives. And we're doing this with interventions that are both cognitive, clinical, and behavioral, and they're all separate. So cognitive interventions are dealing with the thought processes and clinical interventions are based on the assessed needs that they may have, whether they have a psychiatric comorbidity or other issues that need to need a clinical intervention. And of course, behavior is everything and we want to make sure we are shaping behavior. If you smack the child, what's the child going to do? Get angry and throw some more food, right? Okay. But if you say to him, no, we don't do it this way, we do it this way. You're educating, but you're also instilling your value system onto the child. You are teaching them. The fundamental message you're getting, whether you get it from your, your parents or your grandparents or your teachers, do right. Love and care. Love and care. Do right, do the right thing, treat others as you would like to be treated. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. People, there's nothing different from our patients, our clients. All right? So you have to be both parents to the clients you're serving and also their friends. Uh, man, that's a simple message. Okay, so uh, now our therapeutic community programs, we, <coughs> we have programs in different settings. Residential treatment, non-residential treatment, jails and prisons, if you he heard in the introduction. Most of our residential programs have a variable length of stay, anywhere from 30 days to 180 days. Now, we in the United States do not necessarily detox in a hospital setting. We do it in a community-based setting. We believe only the very severe uh, problems such as benzos need a hospital-like detoxification. We run a withdrawal management unit in a residential program in, uh, in, one, of, in one of our settings, and we do not have any doctors on staff and no nurses on staff either. They're all trained counselors. Now, when a medical intervention is required, they will go to the doctor and deal with the intervention, but the withdrawal management is done by counseling staff. And we believe that change is, is um, progressive in different stages, and, and a, a, uh, a, a, an initial stage sets the foundation for subsequent learning. So let's talk about some additional therapeutic assumptions. And this is the big key here, self-help and mutual self-help. Do we understand the distinction? Okay, self-help is when we help ourselves. Mutual is when we get help from others and give them help in return. That's mutual self-help. Peer group learning. The, uh, <coughs> Now remember, in a therapeutic community, we believe that the individual is the main contributor to the change process. Do we get that? Okay. This comes from a, 
a, a wellness model, a strength-based model, not a illness-based model. That's a real key construct for us. We believe that our people can be better and will be better. That's a real fundamental system of belief to make our people. And we believe that they have to heal themselves. We will guide them. We will show them the way. But the healing process must come from within. They must be the agent of change. It is very important that when we're working with women, we make sure that there is safety for them. I am talking about physical safety initially, and that creates psychological safety. So I usually tell my staff when they're talking to folks <coughs> that we're going to be thinking about admitting, I tell them to follow the three S's, safety, security, and sanctuary. You got those three words? Okay. So we all know what safety is, right? We, we must feel that we are safe. Safe from physical harm, but also safe from psychological harm. And I want to go back to things that Seep said earlier. Um, there is no room in a good therapeutic community for any kind of psychological abuse. Period. End of story. So people must feel safe psychologically. And uh, I use a very old-fashioned term called sanctuary. As you know, that folks that um, felt that they were uh, being uh, persecuted originally for uh, religious reasons or, or political reasons always um, sought out a place of sanctuary, a place where they could uh, go and, and feel safe and be themselves. So that's what a therapeutic community does. Creates safety uh, and is a sanctuary. Uh, what do we talk about social learning? Well, we believe that the interactions that people have with one another in a positive way, that is a social learning process. That behaviors get changed as they interact with other peers in, within the therapeutic community environment. And we believe that um, the changes in behavior uh, can also be learned by the varied roles within the TC. We're going to get into the roles in the TC later on tomorrow, but just keep that in mind. We generally have a specific task for everyone, and through the task that they are assigned, they learn new skills, they learn to deal with their attitude, mm -hmm. and they interact with their peers to deal with good behavioral shaping. In a therapeutic community, residents are residents, clients, patients, whatever you want to call them, as well as staff. And that, as well as people who are cooking for the residents. They are also part of the community. So everyone who has a, uh, a task, a role, they are part of the community. Okay. So, as I said, we'll be talking a lot about that. So the social environment is obviously is the context for learning these new behaviors and patterns of thinking. And peers, of course, are the main vectors of social and psychological change. And staff, here's where we come in, we're role models of, su of successful personal change. And also, we're asked to be guides as we guide them through their uh, recovery process. Within the therapeutic community, some of the elements uh, include a commitment to resolve problems and conflicts within the folks in the community. So now, you know, living with other people will always create, from time to time, small tensions, small frictions. Correct? Yes. Okay. So the, the folk, we, what we want to teach them is to resolve the conflicts in a mutually satisfying way so that one does not necessarily win and the other lose, but rather the conflict is resolved through good interaction, honest interaction. So when we talk about TCs, we are 
also describing a group of people who live together and who participate in very specific tasks. Okay. And they share information authentically with one another and they have a commitment to learning from one another. We get these as very simple principles. Okay, now this is what, this, what uh, I consider the staff assets. The staff facilitate learning, they encourage peer feedback, and they also um, talk to folks when there's some emotional setbacks. And the other thing I wanted to say about the staff assets was that <clears throat> uh, the staff have to make sure that there, uh, there, are, there are actually boundaries for the activities that are taking place. In other words, you guys have to be maybe timekeepers, you know, start your groups on time, be, be available for your education groups on time, don't be late, uh, don't slough off, get up when you're supposed to, do your chores, make your bed, that kind of stuff. So staff have to really guide them and model behavior. The Indian society is built on a joint family system. Okay, just apply that concept to the therapeutic community. You're creating a joint family system. That's all. It's not that, that difficult a concept. We're going to teach you how to do it, okay, but just get that concept in, in the back of your mind. A TC, by its definition, is a highly structured environment, and we're going to get to that, okay? To finish my thought for a second, I was just saying that that's an example of how people will integrate eventually. If you learn the value of work, if you learn the value of honesty, if you learn the value of these things and you can internalize that behavior, then you're more able to integrate into the community uh, when you're done with, the, with the, the, the treatment process. And in order to do that, and that's again another one of the elements that we're going to discuss uh, uh, this afternoon and tomorrow, is through a highly structured work environment where part of the treatment process is not only individual therapies, also interaction with your peers, also work as a therapy and as a learning tool. In particular in the United States, a TC is often focused on those individuals with the greatest deficits that Inter have the most amount of, of, of drug use, the most amount of uh, criminal behavior, the most amount of um, other social and personal deficits, right? The least amount of education, the least amount of general work or social or positive interaction. So those, that's to say that those individuals with the greatest of deficits can benefit often the most from the TC process because of this habilitation model that we're describing, which is a focus on learning, which is a focus on values, which is a focus on peer and positive and pro-social interaction, where Dr. Taylor is talking about the family and recreating a family and learning environment, where I'm discussing learning and school. These are all things that individuals who might be coming to your centers have not done effectively already before they got there, correct? Yeah. Right. So you're doing that and recreating that uh, uh, environment and that atmosphere. And I think that that's an important distinction that we're going to dive into uh, uh, much more as we go through the different modules and the sessions that we're discussing, right? So thank you, Dr. Kumar, for uh, trusting us, for believing in us, and for inviting us, and also for making us feel so, so very welcome. I hope that you will part eagerly participate in not only the training modules, I hope that they will be useful to you in the work that you do. And please give us feedback to see how well you feel that the training has been for your particular work. Thank you so much.